Do you ever wonder if the veil between the present and the future could be so thin that it might be peered through? Perhaps for a fleeting moment someone with trained eyes could look beyond our current circumstance and retrieve some critical information from the future and bring it back? Unsurprisingly, there are those who claim to hold such a power, and some of those people have even consulted with kings, queens, and presidents. My name is Josh, and this is Obscure History. Do you believe in ghosts? If you do, you're not alone. Some studies show that at least 40% of Americans believe in ghosts. That's pretty significant. However, that number increases to about 54% when the same study asked participants if they believed in any kind of supernatural being. That's pretty interesting, but things get even more intense when we dig deeper. So it turns out that for a very long time, people have been conducting surveys to try and understand what Americans think about life after death. The results are curious. According to the most recent data, about 75% of people believe that there is some other life after this one waiting for us when we die. Of those people, about 85% believe in a form of paradise or heaven, while the remaining 15% responded with complete uncertainty. Also, only about 65% of Americans who believe in an afterlife believe in a place of eternal punishment, or hell. The study went even further and asked participants to describe what they think the afterlife will be like, and using that data we can surmise that most Americans believe that when they die they go someplace that is peaceful, happy, loving, free from mortal troubles like pain and sickness, and where they can dwell in the presence of a deity. Though the particulars have changed a bit over time, it seems as if people have been interested in the afterlife since there have been people dying. And it makes sense. Death is tragic. Hanging on to the hope that your loved one is somewhere, experiencing something, is really appealing to somebody grasped by the strangling hands of grief. But there has always been this area on the fringe of popular culture that pushes the belief in an afterlife to a whole other level. While around 75% of Americans believe that after death some part of a person travels somewhere and experiences some kind of eternal life, only around 18% of people claim to have seen a ghost, or believe that ghosts can be contacted. So if you're listening to this today, and you genuinely believe that you can communicate with a ghost somehow, you are a statistical minority. At least here in America, I couldn't find global data on the subject. However, just because you're in a statistical minority doesn't mean that you're weird, or even wholly unique. As I said, people have been trying to get in touch with ghosts for forever. Ironically, one of the earliest accounts of spiritualism that we have comes from the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 28. Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war, to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. Surely you know what your servant can do. Therefore, I will make you one of my chief guardians. Forever. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him, and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself 
and put on other clothes. And he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Look, you know what Saul has done. All right, so just a bit of context in case you're not familiar with that story. Saul, who was king of Israel, was worried about some upcoming battles and sought wisdom from Yahweh, which is the proper name of the Judeo-Christian God and is the name specifically referenced in the original Hebrew in this chapter. But God didn't show up. So Saul thought maybe he could go get a spiritist to summon the ghost of Samuel, who was a highly respected prophet in the time before Saul's reign. So he heads off to see this woman, who is now forever only known as the Witch of Endor. The witch successfully summons Samuel's ghost, which prompts some very controversial theological debate, if you're a theology nerd, and Samuel's ghost chastises Saul for seeking a medium instead of being patient and waiting for the wisdom of Yahweh. Now that's just the oldest account that we have. Since then, people have tried thousands of ways to communicate with the dead, and for various reasons. When studying spirit mediums, I think it's very helpful to envision a tree. The trunk of the tree is mediumship in general, the basic idea of trying to communicate with people who have died. Off of that trunk, there are a few very large branches. There's the spiritist branch, which includes practitioners like spirit guides and spirit operators. Even though you might not recognize those terms, you probably know what they are. If you've ever seen a horror film where a spooky psychic allows a spirit to inhabit their body and speak through them, that's spirit operating. Spiritists generally believe that the spirits of the dead make up this sort of energy soup which can be accessed and manipulated by those who have the right kind of skills and training. Another large branch on the mediumship tree is mental mediumship. This includes people who claim to hear from spirits and who advertise their abilities to move things telepathically. Mental mediums are the kind of people that say, like, uh, Oh, wait, (gasps) I'm hearing something. It's your Uncle Dylan, and he says he's very proud of you for getting your food handler's card. (laughs) A similar branch of the tree is physical mediumship. This particular branch has a pretty diverse spread of methodologies, You've got the mediums who use knocking and rapping sounds to communicate with the spirits of the dead, like, uh, all right, ghosts, if you're here, tap twice on the table. (gasps) Oh my gosh. Or perhaps, most popularly, there's the Ouija board. Now, probably the most dramatic of the mediumship branches is trance mediumship. This is what you might expect to see in a horror movie where a medium sits at a table with a bunch of people in a seance and the medium's eyes roll back in their head and they wiggle around for a minute before either writing or speaking some secret message from beyond the veil. Though the tree of mediumship is diverse and has deep roots, there is something that each branch has in common. They are almost always proven to be hoaxes. Most of the time, mediums run a very simple scam. Here. I'll demonstrate. Okay. I'm sensing something now. There's somebody listening to this right now. Your name starts with an A. You've been burdened by the memory of an old trauma lately, and the spirits are telling you that you need to let go of those negative memories. (gasps) They're also telling me that you will have an important interaction at Central Park the next time you're there. All right, and just like that, with a little bit of ambiance and some cut-rate acting skills, I am a psychic. (laughs) So I'll break down what I did there. I made an extremely broad statement. We're all dealing with the memories of old traumas, and we should all let go of those negative memories as much as possible. Also, I personally know that about 2,000 people will listen to this. It's statistically probable that multiple people who have names that begin with A will listen to that message. Even further, I know that about 250 of this episode's downloads will come from New York City specifically. And that's not even mentioning New York State or the greater New York area. Now, I can use that information to make an educated bet that somebody with an A name living near New York City will hear that 
find some significance in the location of Central Park in my broad statement, and they'll be hooked. This isn't really that far off from what most professional mediums do. When you think of the psychics that go on TV shows and have messages for their audience members, most of the time, they have the audience fill out questionnaires, and the medium simply recalls details from a few of them for the performance. Even more sinisterly, there have been a couple of churches who have been busted doing this exact same thing. But in the name of God, rather in the name of spirits or ghosts or your great-granddad. Though mediums are often exposed as frauds, a broken clock is right twice a day, or so the saying goes, and whether they get their information from supernatural sources or entirely mundane sources, there have been a few times where mediums have been right on the money. And that's the hook of it all, isn't it? That's what keeps people coming back, and it's what inspires people to seek out supernatural help in the first place. World leaders and powerful business people seem to seek this hidden knowledge fairly often. Notable examples include Winston Churchill, FDR, Ronald Reagan, and Richard Nixon. They are all said to have sought out psychic knowledge at one point or another during their time in power. And I suppose Nixon also sought regular knowledge a little bit too ambitiously during his time in office as well. Though many mediums have assisted people in various public offices, most of the time we don't know about them because they were inconsequential. A sideshow novelty at best but there was one medium who accurately predicted Abraham Lincoln's assassination. But before we get into that, (gasps) I'm hearing something from the other side. The spirits say that we're about to have 90 seconds of ads coming up in the very near... Before the commercial break, we established that a very slim portion of our general population actually believes that there are people with the power to communicate with the spirits of the dead but we didn't really explore why a person might seek out these services. In researching this episode, I've deduced that there are three primary reasons why a person might seek supernatural knowledge. First, and probably least likely, people seek out supernatural knowledge because they are motivated by power. They are either a successful leader or business person and want to make sure that they are making decisions that will either retain their power or grow it in the ways that they want. Second, a person might seek supernatural knowledge because they are uncertain. Perhaps they have options before them and they just can't figure out a path to go down, so they seek some input from another source. But instead of trying therapy or talking to a good friend, they instead prefer to ask the spirits. Third, and most frequently, people seek out supernatural knowledge out of grief. Losing a loved one is hard, and it's even harder to say no when somebody advertises that they can allow you to speak to that loved one once again. I have been fortunate enough to experience almost no personal loss in my life, but I could not imagine how it would hurt to lose a parent or spouse or child, and how tempting it would be to pay somebody 20 bucks for the chance to hear from that person just one more time. It's from this kind of pain that today's episode was born. On February 20th, 1862, at around 5pm, a young boy died. But he wasn't just any young boy. He was the son of President Abraham Lincoln. Typhoid fever reached into the White House and stole the life away from Willie Lincoln, who was 11 at the time. He was bright, reasonable, and funny. But unfortunately, when death comes to your door, it seldom wishes to negotiate. After the loss, the Lincolns set about the messy business of grieving. Every Thursday after Willie's death, Abraham Lincoln would shut himself away in his office. He was seen by reverends and ministers, but they could not console him. Meanwhile, the First Lady Mary Todd disappeared into her bed for weeks after the death. The entire Lincoln family was nearly unreachable for weeks. In fact, this loss ushered the Lincolns into a crisis of faith. They couldn't simply admit that their beloved son was gone forever, and instead they found solace in a relatively new form of belief. Spiritualism. Spiritualism had found a home in America in the 19th century. Spiritualist newspapers proclaimed the faith, and circles of believers established themselves in leading cities. Those spiritualists spent a great deal of time in the nation's capital. Mary Todd sought their aid often. She began roaming through the White House saying things like, He lives, he comes to me in my dreams. 
These disturbances were so great that Mary Todd's sister wrote in her journal that she was concerned for the safety of the Lincolns. Eventually, Abraham Lincoln would join his wife in attending spiritualist meetings. The Lincolns invited in mediums who performed seances, levitated objects, and claimed that they could speak to the spirit of their dead son. But none of these mediums were able to fully convince Abraham Lincoln of their powers. Word of the Lincoln's newfound fascination with the spirit world spread and celebrity mediums started showing up to the White House to try and hook, perhaps the most powerful clients of all. Margaret Laurie and her daughter Belle Miller, the so-called witches of Georgetown, were among the first and most notable of these high-profile mediums. But the most consequential, and the one who actually did take the Lincolns on as recurring clients, was a man named Charles Colchester. Charles Colchester is a man of mysterious origins. He was born in Britain and lived there for a period, but at some point he immigrated to the United States and began his long career as a full-time hustler. He was red-faced, blue-eyed, and sported a thick mustache, and he proudly told all that he met he was the son of a duke, a claim that was in doubt in his lifetime and was never fully substantiated. In fact, In 1865, some of Colchester's fraud was exposed. June 15, 1865. A spiritual law case. At Rochester, where the knockings originally came from, Mr. Charles J. Colchester, a spiritual medium, has been made subject of a prosecution by the United States Assessor for doing business as a juggler without a license. The defendant denied that he was a juggler, but offered to take out a license as a spiritual medium. The offer was declined. A trial of the case came off Tuesday before Mr. Commissioner Storrs. Witnesses were called on the part of the prosecution to show the nature of the defendant's business. They certified that he had enclosed questions upon various subjects in sealed envelopes, and that without opening them by means of communications with the spirits, appropriate replies were made. Blood-red writing on his arm was also part of the program. The government also suffered evidence to show that Fakir of Ava produced wraps on a table in the same manner, apparently as a spiritual medium. Commissioner Storrs decided that Colchester must take out a license from the United States authorities as a juggler. Despite being outed publicly as a dubious man and illegal juggler, Colchester somehow found himself as one of the hottest mediums in the States. Some papers even called him the nation's leading spiritist. He ingratiated himself with actors, politicians, soldiers, and the American aristocracy, and for a short time found himself as one of Mrs. Lincoln's favorite mediums. At this same time, he became the favorite medium of another high-profile historical figure. After the death of his sister-in-law, Molly, a well-known actor named John Wilkes Booth became a regular client of Colchester's. In fact, the two actually developed a strong friendship and lived with each other for a few weeks leading up to the assassination of President Lincoln. And perhaps, Booth was more than just a client or a friend to Colchester. Author Terry Alford argues that in the weeks before the assassination, Booth roomed at the National Hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue just six blocks from the Capitol and even closer to Ford's Theater. Colchester visited him there often, Besides his ability to contact the dead, Colchester could also tell the future, a useful ability to Booth, who was beginning to think the unthinkable. The pair spent a considerable amount of time together, said George W. Bunker, the National Room's clerk, and they often went out in company. Bunker observed that Colchester was not merely Booth's friend. It was more than that. Colchester was Booth's associate. It's difficult to say exactly what Colchester knew or when, but we do know that in the days before Lincoln's assassination, a couple of very strange things happened. Colchester, who had been one of the Lincoln's favorite mediums, and who had even intrigued the ever-skeptical president, began trying to cheat the presidential family out of money. Colchester had a habit of blatantly swindling people that he didn't like. Clients that weren't likely to become repeat customers, but he was in good at the White House. Perhaps he felt as if he was going to lose their business and thought he needed to become more bold with his cons. We can't say for sure, but what we do know is that Mary Todd Lincoln started to catch on and asked her friend and journalist, 
Noah Brooks to investigate after Colchester attempted to blackmail the presidential family. Brooks attended one of Colchester's seances, and here is his experience in his own words. Mrs. Lincoln told me of these so-called manifestations and asked me to be present in the White House when Colchester would give an exhibition of his powers. I declined, but meanwhile I received an invitation to invest one dollar and attend a Colchester sitting at the house of a Washington gentleman who was a profound believer in this pretentious seer. To gratify my curiosity, I paid the entrance fee and, accompanied by a trusty friend, went to the seance. After the company had been seated around the table in the usual approved manner, the lights were turned out and the silence was broken by the thumping of a drum, the twanging of a banjo, and ringing of bells, all of which instruments had been laid on the table ready for use. By some hocus-pocus it was evident that the operator had freed his hands from the hands of those who sat aside him on the table, and was himself making music in the air. Loosening my hands from my neighbors who were unbelievers, I rose, and grasping in the direction of the drumbeat, grabbed a very solid and fleshy hand in which was held a bell that was being thumped on a drumhead. I shouted, Strike a light! My friend, after what appeared to be an inconscionable length of time, lighted a match, but meanwhile somebody had dealt me a severe blow with the drum, the edge of which cut a slight wound on my forehead. When the gas was finally lighted, the singular spectacle was presented of the son of a duke, firmly grasped by a man whose forehead was covered with blood. While the arrested scion of nobility was glowering at the drum and bells which he still held in his hands, the meeting broke up in the most admired disorder, Lord Colchester slipping out of the room in the confusion. His host subsequently brought down word from the discomforted seer to the effect that Colchester was so outraged by this insult that he refused to reappear. A day or two after this, I was astonished by a note from Mrs. Lincoln requesting me to come to the White House without a moment's delay on a matter of most distressing importance. On my arrival, the lady, somewhat discomposed, showed me a note from Colchester in which he requested that she should procure for him, from the War Department, a pass to New York, and intimated that in case she refused he might have some unpleasant things to say to her. We made an arrangement by which Colchester came to the White House at a specified hour the next day, and after I had been formally introduced to the charlatan, Mrs. Lincoln withdrew from the room. Going up to Colchester, I lifted the hair from the scar on my forehead, yet unhealed, and said, Do you recognize this? The man muttered something about his having been insulted, and then I said, You know that I know you are a swindler and a humbug. Get out of this house and out of this city at once. If you are in Washington tomorrow afternoon at this time, you will be at the old Capitol prison. The little scamp pulled himself together and sneaked out of the house, and so far as I know, out of Washington. I never saw or heard from him afterwards. And nobody saw him afterwards. Now what makes the last few weeks of Colchester's time with the Lincolns even stranger is that he had warned Abraham Lincoln that his life was in danger. Multiple times. If we think about this logically, perhaps Colchester simply assumed that Lincoln's life was in danger because he was a highly controversial political figure, and that seems like an easy grift for a psychic. Or maybe, he knew that his best friend John Wilkes Booth was planning to kill the president in cold blood. Maybe his warnings weren't from the spirits at all, but were from himself, from his own forbidden knowledge. And maybe... Just maybe he disappeared forever because he knew what was going to happen, and rather than stop it, he instead tried to blackmail the presidential family to make a quick buck. Unfortunately, we'll never know. All right, that's the end of this one. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I also really appreciate all of you sticking around last week and checking out Canadian History X, even though I wasn't here. Uh, my brain really appreciated the break. Also, uh, thank you for all of the good vibes and uh, for reaching out. Everybody that did, new job's going great. Very happy with my life choices. <laughs> okay, so uh, a couple of quick announcements before we get to a very, very special uh, outro music today. Um, you'll notice that the website is still there. It is not really what I want it to be yet, but I have not had time to fix it and to make all of the changes that I need to make. However, there is a link to the merch store. Anything that you purchase, uh, a portion of will go to UNICEF. 
because every child in the world should have things like food and water and shelter. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't. Um, really, honestly, that's basically my only announcement. I can't think of anything else that I'm supposed to say. I'm sure that I'm forgetting something, but I, maybe I'm just very excited to get to today's indie music feature because it is a good one. I'm super stoked to present to you a new song from Sounds of Satellites. They're one of my favorite bands, just in general. Uh, and it seems as if it is the first installment of what may be a new record. So if you like this, go follow them on the socials. Uh, I don't have any insider information. Maybe that's completely wrong, but it seems like maybe that's what's going to happen. Uh, so anyways, if you love this, go find Sound of Satell- Sounds of Satellites on all of the socials, Spotify, iTunes, buy their music you know, buy their merch, buy their merch instead of my merch, honestly. (laughs) It's probably way better. All right. So here it is picked up by Sounds of Satellites. This song is very beautiful. Please uh, listen to the end because it is so good. All right. You guys have a nice week. Little reminder of what you said when you were bit but not